Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. I'm going to present the recent thinking of France School on national generation adequacy policies in a European energy market. But first of all, I have to start with a disclaimer. This webinar is not about comparing the benefits of capacity remuneration mechanisms and energy only markets. And it's also not about designing which kind of capacity remuneration mechanism is more appropriate for a given situation. So these are two very interesting questions that have been and are still extensively discussed in the academic literature. But today I want to talk to you about the functioning of national generation adequacy policies, and in particular national capacity remuneration mechanisms, in the specific context of a European internal energy market. So this is a picture you might have seen. You probably know that many member states have started implementing or consider implementing capacity remuneration mechanisms in Europe. These mechanisms aim at remunerating resources not only for generating energy, but also for having capacity available to generate energy if needed. As you can see on this picture, there is a number of different mechanisms. Member states have different things in mind when developing these mechanisms. And actually, you might have your own idea of what justifies the implementation of these schemes. So I would like to ask you to launch this webinar by answering a question. Uh, my question is the following. According to you, what are the main challenges driving the need for capacity remuneration mechanisms in your country? Is it because low energy prices undermine the business model of utilities? Is it because large shares of renewable energy sources introduce new needs that the current system does not and will not deliver? Is it because a large number of aged plants is to retire soon and must be replaced? Or maybe in your country, there is no perceived need for capacity remuneration mechanisms. So I'm going to launch the poll and you are going to be able to answer this question. You can pick several answers. So you should see the poll by now. What, according to you, are the main challenges driving the need, uh, driving the development of capacity remuneration mechanisms in your country? Is it because prices are too low? Is it because f renewables are challenging the current business models? Is it because the, some plants are to be replaced? Is it maybe you think that in your country there is no need for capacity remuneration mechanisms? So I can see that most of you are answering the poll now. I'm going to give you a little bit more time to answer this question. Uh, I remind you that you can pick several answers if you want to. Okay. Some of you are still voting, so I will give you just a bit more time. Okay, I think we can close the poll by now and you are going to be able to see the answers. Okay, so you should be able to see the results now. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is something that is very clear from your answers, is that there is a diversity of uh, rationale for developing or not developing capacity remuneration mechanisms. Well, why does it matter? You've, uh, your answers have uh, shown to us that there are indeed many drivers behind the implementation of capacity remuneration mechanisms. Uh, among others, France, France is facing a high thermal sensitive peak demand, while Spain needs to ensure the profitability of backup for renewables in the context of overcapacity. The UK needs to replace aging or polluting power plants. But these member states also have different resources. The UK and Spain are not well interconnected with the rest of Europe. Germany and Italy, for instance, face internal grid constraints. Some have uh, hydro resources, some nuclear plants, some renewables. And finally, these measures also belong to a wider frame with different objectives. For instance, avoiding price spikes or market power abuse, avoiding the shutdown of power plants, developing demand response. All of these differences, these different needs, these different resources, these different objectives naturally result in different solutions. It is very clear from your answers. It is very clear from this picture. And what is often referred to as a patchwork of capacity remuneration mechanisms has emerged. These differences also explain why it is very unlikely that a common design could fit all European power systems. It will be difficult to conceive an harmonized scheme that could fit the needs 
all these different needs and all these different resources. But it is also clear at the same time that national policies must not lead to autarky. The evolution of load and renewables output in different countries is not perfectly correlated, even between neighboring member states. Extreme events tend to occur in the same period, so for instance winter in Northern Europe, but they do not necessarily occur at the same time. And this is an illustration of this phenomenon based on a study by Poiry of the coincidence of stress events in France and in the UK. The general conclusion of their study was that there was no correlation between very low capacity margins in Great Britain and in neighboring power systems. Because extreme events are often not concomitant, autarky is expensive and requires more resources than a European approach to security of supply. And the impact is not limited to generation adequacy. Uh, these schemes could also distort energy exchanges in the short and in the long run. So it is clear that national schemes must not exclude a regional approach to generation adequacy. At Florence School, we wondered what the prerequisites to Europeanization of national schemes were. We identified three key issues. The first issue is the need for a proper assessment of security of supply at the regional scale. The second issue is the need for a proper assessment, uh, a proper tools to allocate risks and remuneration for contributions of cross-border resources. And the last tool is a method to allocate rights to consume energy at times of extreme scarcity. So let's start with the first prerequisite, the need for a regional assessment of security of supply. If we want national schemes to uh, be compatible with a regional approach to security of supply, the first thing we need is uh, to be able at least to assess the statistical contribution of all cross-border resources to security of supply in a certain member state. Even this uh, basics, this minimum step is not easy and it has been illustrated in a recent report of the Council of European Energy Regulators. This survey highlighted that there was no consistent methodology to assess the availability of interconnection or to take into account properly the correlations between load and renewable output in different member states. But this study also showed that the scenarios employed for national assessments are not always consistent. There is no consistent methodology and there is no consistent input to this methodology. So already this first basic step of assessing the statistical contribution of all cross-border resources is not easy. Assessing the contribution of a specific unit is even more challenging, as it is difficult to identify who is importing and who is importing when markets are coupled. Finally, one should keep in mind that some resources contribute to generation adequacy in several member states. That's precisely why a European approach leads to significant gains. Uh, a single unit can actually contribute to security of supply in France and in the UK at different times. And uh, preventing double counting, which is the participation of a single resource to several generation adequacy schemes, will be expensive. So this is our first challenge assessment. A second challenge we identified is the allocation of risks of energy non-delivery and the remuneration of cross-border resources. But first I would like to ask you this second question. Uh, who do you think should be responsible for the delivery of energy by cross-border resources when needed? Should these resources be responsible? Of course, these resources that have committed to generate when needed must be available when needed. But what about interconnectors? Energy delivery by cross-border resources also depend on their availability. Should the responsibility be allocated to interconnectors, allowing the resources statistically available to export their production? Since both have a role to play, maybe both of them should be responsible. Or maybe actually none of them is able to cope with these responsibilities and another entity, somebody else should be responsible for delivery of energy. So, I'm going to open this uh, second question now, and uh, this time you can only pick one answer. So according to you, who should be responsible for delivery of energy by cross-border resources? These cross-border resources, interconnectors, both cross-border resources and interconnectors, or somebody else? I can see that uh, already half of you have answered the question. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. 
Okay, 10 last seconds and we will have a look at the results together. Okay, I think we can close the poll now. I'm going to share the results with you. Well, once again, uh, you can see that there, are, uh, there is a diversity of answers, but uh, it seems that there is a slight majority for uh, both cross-border interconnectors being responsible for delivery, which seems quite logical since both have a role to play in uh, the delivery of energy by cross-border resources. Well, now I'm going to give you our thinking at Florence School of Regulation of this matter. Well, what we thought was that for energy to be delivered by a cross-border resource, the cross-border resources must be available, the interconnectors must be available, but energy must also flow in the right direction. Of course, the resource operator is most able to manage the cross-border resources availability. And the interconnector operator is most able to manage the interconnection availability. But none of them can guarantee the direction of the flow when this flow is the result of simultaneous conditions in different member states. There is no regional system oper operator that could handle all these uh, variables at the same time. So who should be responsible then and how to remunerate the overall contribution of a specific contribution of some resources and interconnectors? We think this is our second challenge. And the last challenge is the allocation of the rights to consume energy at times of scarcity. You probably remember the fable of the three little pigs. The three little pigs build their respective house, but the two first ones are a bit lazy. They build a house of straw and sticks, while the third one opts for bricks. When the big bad wolf arrives, he is able to destroy the two first houses, but not the one made of bricks. And in the darkest version of this tale, the two first pigs get eaten, while the third one eats the wolf. Efforts are clearly identified and rewarded in this tale. But the challenge we have is that it is not that easy to identify the efforts made by different systems or by different consumers to ensure against energy scarcity. It is also not so easy for European power systems that are interdependent to close the door and enjoy the safe haven of a brick house, especially when some of the resources are located cross-border. Contrarily to the three little pigs, we all live in the same house. But if we want national generation adequacy schemes to become more European friendly, if we want to prevent more risk averse countries from opting for autarky, we must ensure that the efforts made by these countries to avoid scarcity will be recognized at times of scarcity. In other words, we need to ensure that when some consumers must be curtailed, the efforts made to ensure against scarcity will be rewarded. This reward can be physical, the best in short consumers are not curtailed, or it can be financial. The best in short consumers get compensated for curtailment. Some agreements must be reached to value the efforts made through different national schemes with different reliability standards. Everybody should be responsible in an interdependent system to ensure security of supply. But it does not mean that we should forget solidarity. As I have said before, we all live in the same house, and this spirit of solidarity is embodied in the European treaties. There is also a second reason for solidarity, and it is that we cannot avoid black swan events. So the SAE Taleb has developed this concept of unexpected events that have a very low probability, but have a very high impact, and are only predictable ex post. So ex post, we are able to explain why we should have been able to predict them, but before we have no idea they will occur. By nature, there is no way these events can be addressed through market mechanisms and allocation of rights according to efforts to prevent them. We will need solidarity anyway when these black swan events will occur. And this implies that we must define clearly when scarcity should be dealt through market mechanisms and when solidarity should apply. So to summarize, autarky will be costly. We need to find a way to allow a regionalization of generation adequacy. It is difficult to design a capacity remuneration scheme fitting very different resources and very different needs. So we need to allow participation, at least implicitly, of cross-border resources into national generation adequacy policies. We have identified three challenges. It is clear that none of these challenges will be easy to solve and that we have a long debate ahead of us. 
So we can start by debating today. Before answering your questions, I'd like to ask you one last contribution to this webinar. What is, according to you, the main challenge for regional approach towards security of supply? It's the main challenge, the assessment of generation adequacy at the regional level. Today we have different methodologies, different scenarios. Can we find a way to assess properly generation adequacy? Is the main challenge allocation of risks and remuneration for the contribution of cross-border resources? We should be responsible, interconnectors, uh, cross-border resources, uh, somebody else. And finally, we have our third challenge, which is the allocation of rights to consume energy at times of extreme scarcity. How to manage uh, a set of uh, economically compatible incentives with solidarity principles. And after all, maybe you think there is something else that we did not in, take into consideration. And uh, we will be very happy to take your suggestions. So I'm now going to open this uh, final poll and you are going to be able to answer this question. What is, according to you, the most significant challenge for Europeanization of generation adequacy policies? There is no right answer. It's what you think. Is the main challenge assessment? Is the main challenge allocation of risk and remuneration? Or is the main challenge allocation of rights to consume energy at times of extreme scarcity? I will give you some more time to answer this question. Yeah, you have already improved. You are much faster at voting. I will give you 10 more seconds. Once again, there is no right answer. It's uh, after this uh, short speech, what do you think is the main challenge? Okay, I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. Well, uh, well it's difficult to draw conclusions from such a poll, but uh, it appears that assessment does not appear to most of you as the main challenge. And then uh, there are shared concerns and allocation of risk and remuneration and allocation of rights to consume energy. And there is also a small share of you that think we forgot something, so it's good we still have some work to do. Okay, so I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm very happy to take your uh, questions right now. And uh, you can find some more details on our website. You will find the working paper and the corresponding policy brief, which is a short document of six pages. And uh, of course, you can uh, send me some questions by email after this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, for, for your presentation. It was very clear. And we have collected a lot of questions. Uh, I started selecting some of them and I would start with this one. Uh, so uh, if Europeanization cannot be achieved, who would be the losers and the winners when national capacity mechanisms are implemented? Well, oh, this is a question that is, uh, I mean, it is difficult to answer without taking into account the specific details and the specific functioning of the uh, capacity remuneration mechanisms that are going to be implemented. Uh, there, there are two things that can be said. The first one is that it is uh, quite clear from all the studies that exist that if uh, there is no solution that is uh, put into place to regionalize national schemes, uh, everybody will lose on average. And uh, Maybe the, the second thing we can say about it is uh, that there has been a recent uh, study by the consulting group SWECO where they realized the power system modeling of Europe. And well, the general, uh, one of the general conclusions of their study was that uh, consumers in uh, countries implementing generation uh, capacity remuneration mechanisms, consumers tend to lose and uh, consumers who live in countries that did not implement any capacity remuneration mechanisms tend to benefit thanks to this extra security of supply that is added by the mechanisms of their neighbors. But of course, this is a result that depends a lot on the assumptions that are made and so on. Uh, let's say that the thing that we can say is that the impact on the overall social welfare of uh, Europe, if no 
regionalized solution is implemented might be small, but there will be strong distribution effects in any case. Okay. Uh, the second question um, is the following. Um, what are your proposals uh, to address the first challenge, that is to say, uh, how to assess overall, the overall contribution of all cross-border resources? Are there best practice or specific proposals you have? Well, I, I think uh, there, are, there are two kind of challenges in this matter. There is a challenge of uh, developing the right methodology, finding the best practices that exist and improving them if needed. And there is a second challenge, which is harmonization of these uh, best practices and harmonization of the scenarios that are taken into account. Uh, on the first, uh, let's say, more technical issue, maybe there is still uh, a lot that can be done on uh, more probabilistic approaches. There has already been a move from deterministic approach to security of supply to uh, probabilistic approach. As the share of renewables increase a lot, uh, it is clear that the modeling of these uh, variables, the modeling of the correlation between the output of renewables and the high demand and, and so on is a, key, is a key issue. I think that when we look at this report of the Council of Energy Regulators that is giving a list of the methodologies that are in place in the different countries, we can find that there are already in some cases some very good methodologies that have been developed. So to my mind, the main issue is not that technical, it's, it's mostly a problem of uh, finding a way to speak the same language and share the information that the different system operators have in Europe. So. Okay, now it's clear enough. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, why do we need special rules to allocate energy at times of scarcity? Would it be more efficient to determine the flows using short-term price signals? Okay, uh, well, this is a, I mean, it's a fair question. We, we have been implementing uh, market coupling in Europe so that the exchanges uh, would be driven by efficient short-term price signals and uh, we have seen that this has led to a convergence of prices and to increase efficiency. So uh, prices uh, can to some extent uh, help making efficient the exchanges between countries in the short term. Uh, however, there are sometimes uh, when the price signals are not significant or, the, or they are too slow to address the issues that pop up. And uh, this is the case of uh, some of the black swan events we have been talking about, when something that is completely unexpected and has a high impact occur, and it will occur because it, it happens all the time, uh, we might need some other uh, mechanisms to deal with these events. Price signals can deal with uh, exchanges in uh, general situations that might uh, be able to deal with exchanges when we are getting closer to scarcity, but when there is scarcity in different member states altogether, price signals will not be able to drive the exchanges and we will need in any case uh, another mechanism. Well, okay. Uh, let's try to answer to this question also. Um, is there anything the European Commission can do to prevent some member states from implementing a capacity remuneration mechanism in autarky? Should the member states have a right to determine their own generation mix? Uh, well, member states uh, do have a right to choose their generation mix and uh, they also have a right to choose their own uh, uh, level of uh, reliability of security of supply, their own reliability sta standards. It's actually one of the things that uh, make complicated, if not impossible, the design of an harmonized scheme for all European uh, member states. But, uh, and, and security of supply is seen as a, something of general interest, so member states are allowed to take some uh, action to ensure security of supply. The European Commission has issued some uh, guidelines regarding this kind of mechanisms and uh, what is clear is that 
member states will be allowed to put into place such mechanisms, provided these mechanisms are really necessary, so that they are needed for something that the market will not deliver by itself, provided that these mechanisms are uh, proportionate to the issue, so they cannot, be too too, they cannot have too much of an impact if not necessary. And the last thing that is clear is that these uh, schemes should not be closed to cross-border resources. They should not discriminate any resource in general, and in particular, cross-border resources. And the, the European Commission has uh, strong powers regarding state aid, regarding the freedom of trade, and that is considered as a good, uh, to make sure that the national schemes do not go too much into autar autarky solutions. Okay. Thank you, Artur. Uh, I think that the time for today's webinar is coming to an end. Uh, so uh, let me just thank the more than 90 people who attended today's webinar. And of course, Artur, uh, thank you for your uh, contribution today.